uh, recording of this session. So once again, Emeritus Professor, Professor Stephen Perkins uh, from London Metropolitan University on talking about OPE, the role of competing interests. Stephen, uh, the floor is yours and I will go quiet for now and I will see you at the end discussing any questions we might have. Thank you. Carlos, thank you very much for your very warm welcome. I really appreciate it. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, obviously, in these strange times, we're all getting used to these uh, virtual interactions. Um, it still feels strange. Um, one is used to uh, being able to move around rather than uh, being seated when uh, sharing ideas. And obviously, being able to, uh, uh, as all good performers know, you need to uh, get the sense of uh, your audience in order to react to the reaction you're getting. So uh, if you're, you're sticking pins um, in effigies of me during the course of the session, sadly, I shall uh, sail through it um, blissfully ignorant of that. But uh, hopefully we've got a few interesting things that we can uh, talk about. Um, and indeed, the accent is on talking, um, as I will explain, um, looking at this particular topic. Um, so if we uh, go back to the blurb um, that uh, was posted um, as part of the invitation to join this particular session today, um, as we all know, uh, we're at a strange moment, almost a pivotal moment um, in society in general. Um, and therefore, a time when I think um, people are pretty sensitive about what seems to be fair and just and proportionate. Um, and therefore, it's no surprise that um, headlines like this one here about the basis on which somebody who's running a FTSE top 100 company, obviously a major institution. Um, back in my early careers, um, Carlos said I, I worked in a FTSE top uh, 30 business in the energy sector and clearly individuals involved in running those organizations um, have significant accountabilities. However, when one looks at the proportion of what someone can earn literally within the first week of a year, comparing that with what the typical full-time worker does over the entire year, as this CIPD high pay center um, study and the quote from it to shows, um, it's, it's a little wonder that people start asking very searching questions. But as somebody that's been involved um, in looking at this issue for a, a long time now, indeed over several decades, um, this controversy, which attaches to so-called top pay, executive remuneration, executive compensation, as um, the Americans might call it, um, it it's really nothing new um, for at least, as I've said, the last three decades since Graf Crystal in the US published his In Search of um, Excess. Remember that was the, uh, it's a play on words of the In Search of Excellence, um, ex McKinsey uh, scholar that uh, published that work looking at uh, strategy. In this case, it's saying the excess associated with what at that time in particular American executives were paying um, themselves. So it's, it's been on the corporate governance agenda and another American, Robert Monks, who uh, I, I think is generally labeled a, uh, um, a corporate governance or investor activist over many years, um, has been trying to call directors um, of publicly quoted, stock market quoted companies to account. Um, and uh, he, um, in about 2002 with uh, another colleague, Sykes, said that actually this is a systemic problem. It's not something, frankly, that is just dealing with a peripheral issue. Um, it's, it's not a, a remuneration issue. It, it, it is an issue of corporate governance. It goes to the heart of it. Um, where we normally talk about paying um, individuals, providing them with other benefits, the so-called total reward envelope, um, there's been a traditional trinity people have applied to say, so what, what, what is it we're trying to do in rewarding people? Well, we're seeking to attract talent, we're seeking to retain them um, as they start to build the capacity to add value in an organization. And we want to motivate them in a way that will um, continue to apply that value added 
for the benefit of the organization, rewarding them in return for what they contribute. So one thinks about a contribution-based reward approach, but in the area of um, executive reward, it really has gone beyond that. Um, and uh, one of the uh, um, leading executives in the UK, someone who became the lead non-executive for the government in the UK, Lord John Brown, um, who's also been publishing um, and has sought to um, deal with what he regards as a fracture between big business in particular and society, um, talks about the need to repair uh, almost that social compact uh, between business and organisations. And clearly the question then of what some people are getting paid um, arguably is at the heart um, of that ongoing controversy. So we have to say, you know, lots and lots of people have been investigating it, coming from all sorts of different angles, whether they're part of the corporate governance industry, the consultants, the regulators, whether they're in the academic world, are they um, econometricians? Um, are they political scientists? Are they in the area of social psychology, the idea of motivation, etc.? Um, are they sociologists and anthropologists? Uh, lots of different angles. So why is it that all this attention, um, all this expertise uh, hasn't yet resolved the issue? Um, and maybe that's something that we could spend sort of 20 minutes or so now for me just to run through my take on it. And this is my take, um, clearly uh, <laughs> as ever, uh, things depend on who you talk to in terms of the uh, um, opinion that you get on a particular topic. Um, but let me talk about it a little bit from my perspective, sharing an ongoing research programme, an empirical research programme, um, which is uh, uh, still in development. But then I hope have the opportunity to engage in a conversation with uh, all those of you who are kindly participating today. So. Uh, let me uh, move things forward from here. What are we going to talk about? As I said, because um, I do hope this is a conversation. So we've got some headlines here. First of all, we've already touched on some of that background, the controversy that won't go away. Um, I can speak a little more to that in terms of scene setting. Um, and then, of course, the uh, so-called founder of social psychology, Kurt Lewin, back in the middle of the last century, talking about nothing so practical uh, as uh, a good theory. So let's have a bit of theory, because arguably that is going to help us in framing the issues um, in search of solutions, and then seek to bring up to date um, some research that uh, I've been involved in, along with um, various colleagues over quite a long time now. Um, and I should say that uh, whilst, of course, we're working in the area of business and corporate governance, um, the angle that we've taken to head into it has been one that is socially orientated. We're thinking um, in the way in which Berger and Luckman told us back in the 60s about the world as socially constructed. It all depends as to the way in which we as human beings individually and collectively seek to put a construct on what is the nature of the world in which we operate. Um, and therefore we think that um, rather than anticipate some objective perspective um, where we can crunch some numbers and come up with some answers, um, some pat solutions, we need to think about this very much grounded within its uh, social context. Um, a, a, a trinity that I often refer back to is that we make choices um, thinking strategically in organisational business management as well as in research and indeed in every activity of life consequences flow from that, some of which we can predict through our theory, some we are using empirical data, but context is all important in order to ground it. So we want to provide that context if we can for the discussion today. And we're hoping to open up at the end, as I've said, for um, your questions, which will be very welcome. And uh, we'll attempt to uh, proffer some answers or at least responses and further thoughts. Um, we've been writing about this for a number of years. As you can see here, and this is just a few um, of the outputs, um, something where we wanted to trace the evolution of corporate governance um, as the UK Corporate Governance Code, as well as codes of practice, of course, um, in the United States um, and in mainland Europe and elsewhere have evolved. But it has to be said in terms of um, informing this research, 
This is a UK based um, approach that we're taking. We're not seeking to um, generalize necessarily on an international basis, although we think there are perhaps better questions framed and lessons learned that uh, can flow from that. Um, so we've been seeking to put that out into the public domain. Um, and there are a number of other um, academic referee journal articles from the latest round of research um, that are currently being reviewed or are in development. Um, and I'm working with a colleague um, on that. So we've been um, not only uh, saying it uh, 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 with flowers and drink, we're saying it in ink. As any good academic, of course, we need to think about what the key terms are then. So what is it we're talking about? What do I mean when sharing these thoughts with you on some of these topics? Um, starting with, well, who is it? Who uh, um, are the individuals um, that we're seeking to pay attention to? And it's been quite helpful where the Financial Reporting Council, the people that produce the UK Governance Code and act as its guardian, they've defined what they call key management personnel in the way in which um, I've uh, written down here. These are the people who at the end of the day are seeking to decide where the organisation is going, they have control of the resources, um, they overall control the entity um, and the kinds of activities it will take and therefore arguably are accountable for the outcomes produced as a result of that again very much within the particular context within which they operate so we're going to talk about KMP key management personnel um, as uh, the units of analysis where we're uh, focusing our attention what do we mean by remuneration as I said to you before um, a minute or two ago um, we're thinking not just about attract, retain and motivate in terms of pay and benefits for people, whether as wages or salaries, um, bonuses, um, other non-cash benefits. Um, there's something about the executive remuneration, in particular, the way in which um, over years there's been a focus on the medium to long term, although that in itself is a controversial issue. Um, sometimes um, people ask, so what is it that we're seeking to get executives to focus on? Well, they need to achieve um, the long term um, goals of the organisation. How are they going to do that? Well, by achieving the short term goals. OK, so it's interesting. We, we can get into uh, a rather circular debate there. But certainly, as people report on what a, a, a typical executive may get rewarded, we're talking of their salary. Um, calculated on an annual basis, um, a short term incentive paid as a cash bonus generally, and then forms of deferred reward, a long term incentive. And there have been all sorts of things over the years with lots of um, controversy, people having options to purchase shares. Um, they rather fell into disrepute a number of years ago as the corporate governance agenda rolled on because it was found that, well, hang on, it uh, was a case of, uh, you know, heads. Um, uh, I win, tails you lose as far as um, shareholders were concerned, but for executives they could purchase shares irrespective um, of the value of the organisation. Therefore there was a move to so-called LTIPs, long-term incentive plans. The difficulty with those was there seemed to become an imbalance and people seemed to be gaining um, uh, rewards simply because of the movements in stock markets which didn't necessarily relate to what they were doing as those individuals with the authority and responsibility for planning, directing and controlling the activities of the entity that they're responsible for leading. Um, so there, there are issues around those, but one still thinks about um, an, an incentive over the short, medium and long term, arguably focused on delivering strategic objectives. And then um, various other deferred objectives, a retirement pension is a deferred um, and guaranteed generally, or maybe not guaranteed these days, where people have moved towards defined contribution rather than defined benefit pensions, and even executives in so-called uh, so top hat schemes um, have been brought more into line uh, with what it is that individuals in the organisation generally um, are receiving. But uh, there's that part of the package that they defer to the future. And then various other benefits, such as maybe a company car, 
uh, once upon a time people used to get feudal alliances but then the government realized that uh, that became um, something where the treasury were losing taxation so brought these things into line with didn't matter whether you bought it or not some individuals do seek still to use the company provided benefits because then it's a company asset that the company maintains rather than they have to do it and private health insurance which again is meant to be a benefit for the company to get to uh, key people back to work quickly um, as well as a benefit for, for them but obviously again at a time when medical inflation um, runs away it can be seen to be a very significant incentive so executive remuneration tends to provide a, a package um, of uh, elements um, and it can be quite difficult to uh, pin some of those down but of course companies are required now transparently to report on all elements of what is provided, what's the policy, um, how is the policy being applied, what is the outcome in terms of what individuals themselves are receiving. And in terms of what they receive, well there we are, look in the UK, key management personnel remuneration levels, as you can see on average the salary and other benefits amounts to 1.6 million um, ranging from a fairly low level at a, a private company to 18.9 million um, uh, the last time this was counted uh, to the builder Persimmon, Persimmon who were, um, there was a lot of controversy um, you may be aware in terms of their chief executive um, and uh, very high pay, very high performance as expected but Perhaps even more instructive is looking at the total, the aggregate of what these people get rewarded, adding it up across the FTSE 100 companies, um, 2.8 billion pounds. Um, and let's boil it down in terms of the ratio, something that's become important. And indeed from uh, this last year, um, companies have been required to report. What's the ratio comparing the uh, top executive with the average or median level full-time worker and here we have it 119 times is that fair is that reasonable what's the basis of asking the question is it an economic issue is it a political issue um, something that uh, remuneration committees and we're coming on to define them now um, are required to wrestle with and a remco a remuneration committee is a board committee from the corporate board whose role is to develop the reward policy and its application and indeed to account for it the increasing levels of disclosure under regulatory codes that started back with a very slim volume with a committee headed by Sir Adrian Cadbury, Cadbury obviously of that company's name albeit not an independent company yet anymore but uh, the Cadbury code in 1992 establishing a principle which still applies you either comply with the code it's a guideline, it's not meant to be um, legislation, although requirement to um, um, continue to be registered with the stock market, um, compliance with the code was part of that. But actually it wasn't saying that you have no alternative, you need to explain if you're departing from it. And as we can see, um, when we look at uh, what people have done, um, there's probably not been too much explanation um, and possibly uh, not too much departure from, frankly, yet rather homogenous policies, which one can argue really doesn't align with any notion of strategic, um, competitive focusing of an organisation. Anyway, in terms of that reporting, policies have to be approved. Um, there are votes which impact on the chair of the remuneration committee as with any other corporate director. Um, also, since the financial crisis um, back in 2008-9, a clawback provision where particularly bonus payments were seen to be inappropriate, um, although pretty difficult clawing back once things have been paid out. As I mentioned now, part of the disclosure includes pay ratios to help people get a handle on. So what, what seems right, what is fair? Um, distortion unfortunately can creep in because if you're overall a very high paying organization the ratio between the individual at the top say of a major professional services organization um, people in the IT sector it, it may be a fairly small ratio whereas if you're running um, a services business with people on minimum um, or living wage uh, that gap will be very large how do we make sense of it 
as I said, there's a whole industry around this now with um, advisors, whether they're in-house, the human resources professionals, the reward people, the company secretary, because this is a governance matter, and investor relations because of the interaction with the investment community. Um, but increasingly, uh, the Corporate's Governance Code has said that the Remuneration Committee should be seeking not just advice from the company and its people, but from independent consultants. And what does independent mean? One of the comments that we've seen recently is, well, that's all very well and good. Um, uh, people can come from outside and indeed have a lot of helpful benchmarking data, but are they really constructing advice to help people with these very difficult controversial decisions? Well, that may be having the inside knowledge, non-executive directors, running the remuneration committee by definition um, are one stage removed from the business so they can't know about the nitty-gritty in the way in which an insider would so how do they get the information balancing what seems appropriate if you're going to make comparisons with others with what in context is appropriate for the organization as i said this is a controversy that's not gone away and you know any day if you glance at the financial press you'll see um, ongoing headlines as the ones that I've picked out from earlier this month here where investors are protesting, trade unions um, are calling on investors to tackle a problem and indeed the government has sought to enjoin um, those parties who are representing the um, shareholders, the beneficial holders, people whose pensions, people whose insurances depend on them um, to oversee this issue um, and whilst some are now taking it more and more seriously, as you can understand, there's a reluctance and indeed maybe yet again a lack of expertise, but nonetheless being asked to do it. And um, whilst there are opportunities to reform the government, put out revised guidelines um, according to what the FT said um, in its editorial board um, fairly recently, they feel this has been an opportunity squandered. So a lot more work still. To be done. Here you can see that since the Cadbury report then in 1992, um, a lot of people, um, a lot of individuals sitting together, um, indeed what uh, Pinsley Mason's uh, city law firm described as a group of uh, uh, city grandees leading various commissions and they put their names to them as you can see here, um, and maybe that's a factor and certainly one of the sources of explanation that uh, um, I, I believe is well worth exploring in this socially constructed world of executive remuneration and its management. Um, and as we said, there are implications um, as Deborah Hargreaves, um, someone who's quite an activist in this field, a critical commentator, um, not anti-capitalist, but if you like saying there's these greedy executives that are wrecking capitalism for the rest of us. And in the title, I talk about competing interest streams. And so this is the point. We might think, well, hang on, this is a, all about the capitalist enterprise. Isn't this a homogenous group of individuals who um, arguably have got to stay? Aren't they colluding in this process? Well, actually, um, as some work uh, showed us back in the 1980s from a Dutch academic, Tulings, um, these various people may um, have a, a, a broad um, frame of reference which may be shared, but actually they're competing uh, to control the agenda like anyone else. So um, Theresa May, when she uh, was prime minister, um, as you could see, uh, again came out up very early in her premiership. Sadly, uh, perhaps for her, um, there was never really the time and space to deliver on this, but concerned about the unacceptable face of capitalism, damaging um, the social fabric of the country and the way in which I mentioned Lord Brown had flagged an issue. And investors through the Investment Association, um, whilst wary of being dragged into this controversial issue, nonetheless writing out, as you can see, um, a, a couple of years or so ago, saying, you need to rein in what's seen as an excess because that's now bringing us into um, a focus where frankly because we're normally behind the scenes uh, we don't like to be so there we go um even 
in, um, uh, again, this, this year, just earlier in the spring, we've got government ministers um, vowing to bring in the auditors now and the so-called rogue directors over what people are paying themselves. Um, real shake-up, they claim, in corporate governance, not just in terms of reward management, not indeed just in terms of corporate governance, but concerns about social justice. We come back to the sign of the times. Um, this is something that's not only about effective leadership and management, it's about business and society. And the very fact of drawing attention to that arguably is controversial in and of itself. And what we said, my colleague, um, Chris Hendry at City University a number of years ago, when we um, published a piece in Journal of Management Studies, from a first round of conversations with some of the key decision takers, we made the point that actually it's not just the social outcomes, it's the antecedents. What goes on? What's taking place in those in camera, behind closed doors, boardroom, remuneration committee discussions? Um, what is it that can help our understanding if only we can draw out individuals who, frankly, very rarely um, will speak openly about their views. They, they report, they're required to report in the annual reports that go along with company annual reports. They go to the annual general meetings. Um, the lead director, the chair of the REM committee may be answering difficult questions, but do they actually talk about the interaction, the way they constitute the REM committee, um, the makeup of people and backgrounds, and, and the way in which perhaps that brings some influence to bear on the way in which they frame their questions, let alone the decisions that they take. I said we have a bit of theory, and uh, at this point, let's just give you a quick overview of that. I'm not going to linger um, too long on it because uh, I know we want to get to a conclusion and get to conversation. But if we go back to um, the 1970s, there was a very interesting set of interactions between um, Americans, um, uh, political science theorists, Pfeffer and Solanik, back in 1977. And there was a lot of criticism at that time. This was the era of high corporatism, where it was being argued before the Thatcher Reaganite. Um, a, a, a neoliberal revolution um, into uh, the uh, um, late 1970s into the 1980s, that it was seen that there was collusion between those who, because shareholders by definition were dispersed, couldn't control what the individuals were doing leading their businesses. And it was argued that rather than colluding with shareholders in deciding what was good for the company, good for the investors, there was actually a collusion with organized labor for an easy life. And therefore, the economist Jim Jensen Meckling um, came along with this notion of principal agent theory, which you may have come across, um, which was suggesting what we need to do is to get executives thinking like shareholders. What we need to do is to give them an incentive that, if you like, disconnects them from other people in the organization. It's only strange, of course, as we see it now. And indeed, um, later on, Jenkson and uh, Meckling uh, uh, in the uh, um, uh, um, mid um, 2000s came back and said, mm, do you know what? It's leading to certain perverse outcomes. This principal agent theory may be in the way in which it's being interpreted is losing its context and not having the outcome um, that we had predicted. Um, then we have the so-called optimal contracting, um, an approach that says, well, what you need to do is to bear in mind that there's a lot of outrage. We see this outrage at so-called excess um, rewards, um, rent-seeking behaviors in the uh, economics parlance on the path of, uh, um, in, uh, of directors in companies using their power to be able to extract more than frankly they deserve. And what you've therefore got to do, people running remuneration committees, is to strike a balance and you need to think about what you need to pay. The reward needs to be sufficiently powerful so that it does retain and motivate um, and focus executives on what you need them to do. But on the other hand, it should not be of a level that's going to lead to this public outrage in the way in which we've seen, well, that went well, didn't it? And indeed, therefore, we think about perhaps that social dimension. 
Is it something to do, well, just with collusion, people sitting on one another's boards? A lot of the research we've done suggests that people aren't doing it in, in that active way. Um, but actually, it's the mindsets. Is it something about the homogeneity of the backgrounds that people have, even if they came from fairly humble beginnings? Once they've entered that boardroom world, um, I remember talking to the former chair of Eurotunnel during the first round of research, and he was saying, you know, part of the reason people do this is not for the money. It is for the corporate jet. It is for um, the uh, um, ability to stay in a first class hotel, as well as the thrill um, of leading the organisation. There's a particular mindset, therefore, that we may see coming through. Again, as with all theory, this is speculative. Does it help us? And we put in the middle. Um, the Turing's work that I referred to already, that we're not seeking to say this is a group of people um, in some conspiracy theory sitting there pulling the levers to satisfy themselves rather than others. There's a lot of competition going on in there too. And we need to pay attention to that in the way in which the agenda to control the debate may fluctuate over time. And therefore the various groups, whether it's government, whether it's shareholders, um, and their investment institutions, whether it's managers, whether it's the media, are struggling to hold that agenda to decide um, what the questions are and how um, it uh, may be addressed. So this is what we've been seeking to do. If the econometric analysis um, is falling a little bit short, um, let's have a look at the social dimension. Let's understand interaction. What's going on associated with executive decision taking? And as I said, what is the influence of socialization um, when we look at the kinds of questions that we think are appropriate in terms of the context and the roles and the character of dialogue, getting executives talking to us? What are the narratives for them to explain what's going on? And using work that Andrew Pettigrew um, had developed again back in the early 1990s, what he called the network stars approach, people who, we're not seeking to come up with um, a, a, a sample that is a so-called statistically representative sample, um, one that we can then seek to crunch some numbers and generalize from. But because these people influence the scene, the agenda, actually they, they have a network, which means that listening to them probably helps us in the way in which the ethno methodologists might have suggested really to get society out of a fairly smallish group of people and these are the kind of folks whilst we don't name them individually fortunately and again this is a snowball sampling approach we've used our networks i had a conversation for example with lord brown at an event where i was speaking some time ago and asked him would he be willing to share thoughts. He in turn then helped open the door to some of these other people, whether they were board members, non-executive directors, institutional investors, some of the advisors working with them, and indeed looking in-house at some of the people who um, are actually network stars within the HR community. And that group um, that we've talked to in the last couple of years or so that we're currently, as I've said, compiling and going through reviewing for our results with, um, comparing contrast with what we saw back in 2005. And again, a similar approach, although that time, we also talked to some, some executive search consultants because arguably they were helping to set the agenda in terms of identifying individuals and setting the scene in terms of, well, what do you need to pay individuals to um, join this organization, to move between organizations? The bottom line message in all of this, um, and uh, indeed it's going to be the, <laughs> the title of a paper, is frankly, we really don't see much change between what we learned in 2005 in terms of the core message, some of the perversity which um, is emerging in this corporate governance debate about executive reward, the unexpected consequences, the unplanned consequences, um, and indeed further and further attempts to control, to regulate. Um, and that's what deserves, I think, the inside view. And whilst, as we've said, we're making trade-offs in terms of generalizability, we actually believe that we still can generalize in terms of the questions to ask, the context in which to pose some of our findings, um, and the access to people who, frankly, would not normally share their views, but who were 
provided that they were not going to be individually quoted. And clearly, there's no intent to embarrass anyone to share their views directly with us. So let's, before we um, wrap up what I have to say and move to the dialogue between us, just throw at you, and I apologize, I'm breaking all the rules of how you do presentations, giving a lot of rich text, but this is a rich text-based research. Um, here we've got a sense of um, the norms and values. We're getting into that upper echelon um, uh, approach. These individuals um, feel it's just common sense. Of course, they should be rewarded. It's no problem if it's 50 to 100 million particularly looking across the Atlantic. And indeed, with Hambrick and Mason's upper echelon benchmark, if you read perhaps uh, later, if you look at the slides at your leisure, it actually talks here, um, and this is a quote from one of our respondents, about this upper echelon feel. People come from a world where, you know, they wouldn't expect to get out of bed for more than a particular sum. And isn't it interesting? And although certain people said it's really odd that people making the decisions don't necessarily um, share that world deeply in terms of their own background, they've just got into a mindset and therefore arguably nodding things through, but now being called to account in terms of saying, well, why? Why did you make those decisions? Well, says one of our respondents, you've got to sell it in. You should be saying to your investors, if we succeed, and even if there's a downturn in the economy, we're not going to pull back on the reward. If you don't agree with this, we'll get a different set of directors. Um, quite, a, quite a pugnacious line. And therefore, taking us back to what I've been saying, this collusion, has that gone away? What about thinking like a, a shareholder? Are we operating in a manner that Jensen and his colleagues suggested back in 1976? Or, as he suggested in 2004, is it managing earnings in a way that destroys value and can deceive investors? Pretty uh, heavy stuff. And indeed, the econometricians for years and years have looked at this and they've sought, of course, say, well, surely it must be to do with corporate performance. The only thing that seems to have an effective statistical correlation um, that's significant is the company size. There's the issue of then, well, surely we have to put people through tournaments, you know, that they need to feel that the winner um, takes all. But the problem there became, um, well, if we're allowing people beyond the chief executive to participate in tournaments as they're climbing up the corporate pyramid, what about the headroom? Because we need to pay the top person even more. So therefore, the ratchet effect goes on even further. And as I said, although there's been this concern and attempt to control the governance agenda, who controls the agenda? Um, again, back in the 60s, Backrack and Barats, you know, they talk about um, who is it that controls the agenda? They're the ones that have the power to determine the, the, the ground rules for debate. And as one of our one of our respondents from the first round of research said it quite pithily, what would you expect a butcher to say if you ask about the merits of meat products? If we're asking those people that are part of that world, um, are they going to talk themselves down? But as I've said, we then got the checks and balances um, of the competing institutional interest streams. Okay, but, and this is the but that some executives now are, are, are starting in their reflections with us to say, well, it's a bridge too far. You know, everybody, if they, they think about the Richard Branson effect or the Alan Sugar effect, entrepreneurs, self-made um, multi-multi-millionaires or billionaires, people kind of accept that to a degree, just like the sports or entertainment industry stars. But frankly, if these are people who are pretty average performers, now we're going to get into a different debate. We're starting to get into a moral and ethical review. And this is where the REM committee people and the institutional investors in their feedback to us are saying, but we're ill-equipped for this. The institutional investors in particular have said, do, do you know what? In the past, we've really sent in people who um, they know about uh, are, are the mechanics of the financials of the organization, um, but can they really get into the minutiae of executive reward, even though we now accept it's a corporate governance issue? So it's leading to the whole basis of 
resourcing for the corporate governance of organisations in and of itself at various levels um, of the economy and society. Now, some people have picked up on this concern about the perverse outcomes of incentives. Um, we have the clawback provision, as I said, with bankers allegedly paying themselves for um, perverse outcomes at the time of the financial collapse. Um, should we be paying more attention to salary? The issue for that has been over the last couple of years, yes, yes, we'll pull back onto salary, but individuals are saying, but basically, you better increase my basic pay then, my guaranteed pay. Well, where's the incentive? So the controversy continues to roll forward. And with a bonus, what does a bonus mean? Frankly, somebody would argue, well, you know, if we're looking at an executive, um, are these people who really are meant to be star performers, they're going to create an organization second to none. They're going to focus on taking this organization um, uh, sustainably to a position of competitive advantage. And therefore you need to be able to turn the bonus pool on and off. Is that feasible? How do individuals feel about that when, unlike the investor, of course, they're putting all their options into a single basket? So do we come back to this tug of war? Um, the comment here about the most miserable bastards, should they, they be the ones to serve on REMCOs? Because the trouble is with the people who serve as members of boards, they're on a REM committee, sometimes they've got to make tough decisions about the people who, in the next meeting, they're working together as partners to lead the business. Interesting dilemmas. But, as it said here, that unless it's recognised that something is done and people start acting on it, then there's never going to be any headway at pushing back at these concerns of social justice. But the unintended consequences, it's been argued, is that if you've revealed, as the government's agenda requires, exactly what people are getting rewarded for, does that lead to situations such as one of the respondents said, well, you know what we do, because we worry about journalists, we bring somebody onto the board and normally we'd start them like anyone on a modest, albeit fit for purpose, reward package. And then over time you'd expect as they perform, as they contribute to increase that. Not anymore, because we don't want reports of major shifts in reward. reward. So therefore we're overpaying at an early stage. There's a lot of unintended consequences coming through with the best of endeavours of corporate governance. And again, picking up some institutional theory, this isomorphic approach, the fact that people are copying, whether they're copying to follow the coercion of corporate governance, if they're simply doing what they think is so-called best practice, or they brought in professionals, the normative approach, what we're actually seeing is um, cookie cutters, institutional um, isomorphism in top pay, Regulations, it says here, has encouraged people simply to do the same as everyone else. And shareholders, whilst they're meant to be engaging in this, to say, well, it's got to be more fit for purpose, surely, therefore, we need to look at your context. Well, they're worried. They're actually, as I said earlier on, maybe not equipped to make the decisions, the fine tuning decisions. And therefore, what do we see? We see replication, which unfortunately means the problem simply rolls forward. So, we end up where we started, um, and indeed just uh, a few days ago, yet another um, a, a piece in the Financial Times by Tom Braithwaite this time, he argues that it's hypocritical to attack CEO pay. What he says is that institution investors ought to be spending the time thinking about serving their clients, serving the beneficial shareholders, um, rather than worrying about the um, minutiae of executive reward, because if their clients get richer, won't it be worth it? Or we leave this as, frankly, uh, um, the so-called wicked problem. This is a moral issue. It's not something that can be easily reduced to um, an ec economic or arguably market-based factor. Um, so I think the debate will roll and roll. So I thank you for your attention so far, and hopefully we can uh, have some conversation around that in the time that's left to us. Carlos, back up to you. Stephen, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. The time flew with uh, your presentation, uh, but we just have 
a few minutes left for um, a few questions we have. I also have a question if I manage to get some time to um, actually ask you. Um, before going to the questions, just let me share with our audience that we have two, uh, again, equally interesting uh, master classes in the next uh, couple of weeks on uh, 9th of June, examining the sustainability of the secular economy with Pauline Deutsch from University of Hull, and then on the 16th of June, a very interesting master class for those who are business owners or managers, um, mindfulness and resilience for entrepreneurs and business leaders by Glenda Rivo Allen. And I'm going uh, very, very quickly to our questions. Thank you very much for your questions. A very engaging uh, session, I have to say. Uh, let me start with a theoretical question first, uh, Stephen. Um, Paul, thank you, Paul, for your question. Your definition of executive seems to exclude the consideration of excessive reward uh, in the financial services sector. What is your view of this? Financial services, of course, have long been a law unto themselves. Um, and anybody that's worked in the reward arena has known that um, for uh, um, time immemorial, people working in financial services have tended, if you look at jobs on a job evaluation basis, like for like, to attract a premium, we're not sure why. Um, actually, the key management personnel, one could argue that within financial services, these individuals do have an impact. They will control resources. They will um, have oversight um, of the organization's future health. So I, I agree with you entirely. We probably need to refine the Financial Reporting Council's definition that we've used, but it is certainly not intended to exclude the financial services sector. Um, they're very much in our sights. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Paul, for this question. Next question from Elena. It's a question that I'm sharing with Elena as well, very interesting one, I would say. Uh, should companies link pay to improvements in ESG and sustainability goals? And how could they, they do that? And if I can add a sub question to this one, based on, from your work and linking back this question to your work in 2005 in JMS, how have you seen this discussion being evolved through the years, Stephen? Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and thanks for the question. Um, that so-called triple bottom line approach is something which, as you know, has been rehearsed quite a lot um, over the, the past uh, um, decade and more. Um, clearly what uh, I think REM committees um, have been struggling with, well, how do we make sure that whilst at one hand making sure that there's stewardship of the business, meeting the requirements driven by the investors who arguably their fiduciary duty is to make profits which can be distributed to their shareholders. But, and this is the but that I think people are factoring into the conversation now, if the institutional reputation is suffering and that is going to have an adverse effect on the bottom line, it's worth looking beyond that. And you're quite right, bringing in improvements in terms of the environmental um, and related sustainability goals, indeed issues around um, social justice and being seen to manage fairly um, and effectively, and certainly avoiding um, some of the potential bias um, that uh, has been um, um, uh, uh, certainly alleged um, in organisations. Um, it certainly is, should be part of the agenda. It's not going to be easy. And I think there are a lot of Remco chairs who are now saying, actually, this is the reason why when we pick consultants, these so-called independent advisors sitting alongside any people we get from within, we want them that can help us talk through the strategy, can help us talk about some of these very difficult non-administrative problems, um, but, to be honest, most uh, are, are of the people are still coming up with their benchmarking and uh, because they're driven by the shareholders to fall into the cookie cutter mold. Again, it's, it remains a, a very delicate and controversial issue, but I think it's, it certainly deserves and will get a hearing. Thanks, Stephen. Just we have uh, very few, uh, a couple of minutes for another two questions. If so, if you have, if we can have your very quick question on this, because the audience really wants to know more about that. So we have Daniel's question. Thank you, Daniel. Um, is the perception of excessive rewards related to the lack of a corporate governance framework for setting the remuneration for all paid decisions within companies? And 
also Daniel adds that the separation of the pay of top managers by Remcos and then the pay of the rest of the workers. And, and that's the point, isn't it? The great disconnect. Obviously, from a Remco point of view, they're saying, do you know what, when, when we talk to them, it's difficult enough because we're not working day in, day out with these individuals. We meet the top executives um, for board meetings and committees. Um, most of those committees, of course, are comprised of non-exec directors these days. Yes, we're now meant to be setting the policy as far as the next tier is concerned. I think the era of um, pay ratios is going to force that debate. Should the REM committee, at the very least, set the overall framework for thinking about governance and reward at every level of the organization? So I play it back as a question rather than an answer, because there isn't a, an answer. It's certainly in development. People are wrestling with it, um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in practice. But I do know they are thinking about it. Thank you, Stephen. And the very last question from uh, Jane. Uh, thanks, Jane. Um, do management qualifications link into high rewards still? I think that um, one would tend to anticipate that once you get to the board level, it will be anticipated that actually it's your experience, it's your contribution, that it, it'll be taken as a given that you have um, management qualifications. So people who are going to move up the pyramid. Yes, it's true that once you enter the world of junior, middle and into senior management, yes, of course, it's very important. And therefore, in fact, part of the total reward portfolio for people to be supported by organisations to gain those qualifications. For the board, frankly, I think um, if by that time they really don't, it's as we often say to our students, it's not just about getting your award in what life that is, then it's about what you do with it. And I think for um, board directors, um, that uh, message is, is very powerful and very strong. But it doesn't mean to say you shouldn't be doing it, you're climbing up the greasy pole. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, that was a really uh, very interesting and constructive discussion, I guess. I would like to thank you once more for this um, um, presentation and also to thank you for offering the time to be with us today and sharing your uh, expertise and the knowledge around this very um, topical area. And also thanks everyone for attending this masterclass. Please go, um, you can go and visit the future to the york.ac.uk slash events slash masterclasses to check the future masterclasses. So uh, again, thank you very much everyone. Thank you very much, Stephen. And see you in the next masterclass in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks.